Hey everyone, I've got a very interesting topic for you for this week on our research updates and it's the role of probiotics and how they can impact our IVF success rate. So anyone going for an IVF procedure knows exactly, you know, the amount of financial investment, but also emotional investment, mental investment, and everything that has to go into this process um, to have a shot at conception. So it's very important to share these numbers right from the start. And Basically, if we have a uterine environment that is lactobacillus dominant, so lactobacillus being a particular type of species of bacteria, which seems to have a very protective impact on uh, reproductive function, but also supporting pregnancy, implantation, caring to term, those patients are almost three times more likely to have a positive pregnancy test compared to patients that have a uterine microbiome that is not dominant in lactobacillus species. And it goes beyond just getting pregnant too. So in this particular study that was uh, that we're looking at, they observed that patients who had a lactobacillus dominant species in the uterine environment had almost a 10 times increased likelihood of caring to term and giving a birth uh, to a live baby compared to the patients that had a non-lactobacillus dominant environment. So when I first started looking at this research, for me, it was the first question that popped into my head was, how does taking oral probiotics help with the uterine microbiome? Because they're two separate organs. We're talking about the large intestine and then the uterus. So, you know, the bacteria isn't traveling through the blood, obviously. So what are the modes of communication? How are How is the oral probiotic impacting the growth of healthy bacteria in the uterus? And so a new research paper published last year um, basically looked at that and they established two different modes of communication, very interesting modes of communication, um, through which they, the microbiome in the uterus and the vaginal canal can communicate with the microbiome in the gut. And so the first mode of communication that they discussed is something called the microgenderome. It's the fluctuation of hormone levels in the blood as a result of the type of bacteria in the gut. So it's pretty well established that the different presence of different types of bacteria in the digestive tract can impact our reabsorption of a very important hormone called estrogen. And estrogen can uh, estrogen absor absorption can go up or down if the gut health becomes imbalanced or the microbiome becomes imbalanced. So there's studies showing that if we have an unhealthy gut bacteria, our estrogen reabsorption can go way up or it can go way down depending on which type of bacteria become predominant in the, in the gut microbiome. So this fluctuating level of estrogen, depending on the type of bacteria in the gut, actually influences um, the acidity of the vaginal canal as well. So it lowers the pH if we have optimal levels of estrogen. And this lowered pH actually prohibits the growth of these harmful bacteria and makes it much easier for the lactobacillus species, the helpful and protective bacteria we're seeing in all these new studies to grow. And that lactobacillus species in turn helps to lower the pH as well. So it becomes like a positive relationship, a synergistic uh, relationship between estrogen and the lactobacillus species. And so they've even seen in certain animal studies that just impacting the gut microbiome, we can fluctuate or change levels of testosterone in the body as well. So through fluctuation of hormone levels, we can have an indirect impact on the type of bacteria that seems to flourish or not flourish in the reproductive microbiome. And the second uh, mode uh, of communication between the two microbiomes is actually the immune system. So it can help uh, having a healthy gut microbiome seems to improve our resilience to fighting off the bacteria that may be harmful and reducing the risk of infection. But it also seems to uh, decrease inflammation. So inflammation seems to be the other mode of communication through the immune system. So if either organ has harmful bacteria or has dysbiosis, which is an imbalance in the microbiome, it increases the production of a lot of, a lot of inflammatory markers, which increase inflammation. But it doesn't increase inflammation just in its own organ. It also impacts inflammation in the other organ. So if we have increased inflammation in the gut, it increases inflammation in the uterus and vice versa. And that increased inflammation predisposes that organ to more infection. So it d interrupts the, um, the surface mucosa and it can impact the ability of these harmful bacteria to invade further and cause an infection. 
um, and further raise inflammation. And this inflammation is one of the pathogenic roles by which it seems to impact implantation rates, pregnancy, basically the immune system becomes a bit too active um, in cases of dysbiosis. And so, you know, how do we actually impact those numbers? Like there are studies looking at that uh, patients who take a certain probiotic called lactobacillus rhamnosus. If you take it orally for up to a month, you can increase the population potentially of the, the same bacteria in the uterine microbiome or the reproductive microbiome by 10%, which is quite significant looking at just that one strain of bacteria. And so oral probiotics seem to have an impact on the reproductive microbiome through that, you know, the immune system, the inflammation, and then the microgenderome, which is a fluctuation at different hormone levels. And it's quite significant because even you know, going back to that one of these original studies, what they found was that patients who had that lactobacillus dominant environment were 10 times more likely to conceive. Um, sorry, three times more likely to conceive, almost three times more likely to conceive with IVF, and almost 10 times more likely to give um, birth to a healthy live baby compared to the patients that didn't have a lactobacillus dominant environment. So this is something we're working very closely with for a lot of patients that have had a history of recurrent miscarriages. And then they also have these like mild, moderate symptoms that are very subtle of vaginal dysbiosis or harmful bacteria growing, such as increased discharge or change in odor. Um, but it's hard to just depend on those symptoms as well, you know, um, the physical symptoms, because up to 50% of patients that have dysbiosis actually don't present with any symptoms. So they won't have any changes in discharge or odor. Um, so we also have to look at the clinical history, like if there's, are, if there are patients who have consistently failed uh, fertility treatments or consistently having miscarriages, this is a very important factor to look at. And looking at the relative, um, you know, safety profile of something like probiotics, uh, it becomes almost a no-brainer trying to include, incorporate, or using this as a treatment option to, uh, you know, give us an ad advantageous. Um, step in improving our chances for success with a procedure like IVF. And then, so then we get into the conversation of, well, which probiotics are helpful, which probiotics seem to have a better impact. And this is something we're still learning. And a lot of probiotics on the market have, you know, a variety of different strains. And the studies are also looking at different types of strains of bacteria that seem to have this positive impact, um, particularly lactobacillus uh, brevis seems to be one that keeps coming up, lactobacillus reuteri. These seem to be ones that help to reduce the growth of harmful bacteria and vaginal dysbiosis um, in the reproductive microbiome, among other strains of bacteria as well. So this is something very important to include if you have been going for fertility treatments that hasn't been working. Um, it's important to take a closer look at the microbiome in the gut and the reproductive uh, tract as well. And you know, Back years ago, the belief was that the endometrium, the uterus, is actually a sterile environment. There's no bacteria present. And that was because the cervical plug, the mucus plug, that separates the vaginal canal um, from the endo uh, endometrium or from the uterus was believed to block the, the passage of any bacteria. But what we've seen over the last few years uh, in research is that the mucus plug actually is not impermeable, that it's actually very much possible for different strains of bacteria to passively move and migrate from the uterus to the reproductive tract to the vaginal canal and from the vaginal canal to the, to the uterus as well. So there is this what we call crosstalk, where they start to communicate with each other with the types of bacteria. And, you know, there's a lot of interesting trials now looking at you know, a chronic reproductive disorder such as endometriosis. For example, um, women who took a course of antibiotics right before IVF transfer were found to have a much higher success rate or much higher pregnancy rate. So it's like, what is the role of, you know, an anti antibiotic in improving our chances of, of success? So it seems to impact the microbiome as well. And patients with endometriosis seem to have very low levels of lactobacillus compared to age-controlled um, you know, patients who don't have endometriosis. And they seem to have higher levels of these other harmful bacteria um, that aren't lactobacillus 
uh, present if endometriosis is also present in the, in those patients. Same thing with polycystic ovarian syndrome. Uh, there's plenty of studies now differentiating the type of gut microbiome we see is very different from patients uh, with PCOS, PCOS and without PCOS. So with PCOS, we start to see a lot more of these bacterial strains that increase inflammation and bacteria that increase the production of something called lipopolysaccharides or LPS. And the, this increase in inflammation and LPS, which triggers inflammation, um, worsens insulin sensitivity, uh, increases inflammation, seems to uh, worsen blood sugar balance, and this increase in insulin, we know uh, for anyone with PCOS, that insulin is a driver for increasing testosterone and androgen hormones. So it's a very close relationship between the type of bacteria in the gut and um, the hormonal imbalance we know and, and very well describes polycystic ovarian syndrome. So it's really important to bring it back into when we're going for a procedure like IVF, how simple things like diet, fiber, probiotics, and the right probiotics, not just any probiotic, like strains that have actually been studied to help with fertility, with the reproductive microbiome, may actually have a huge impact on your outcomes. But when you're going for an IVF, very few uh, patients, I think, have a discussion on, hey, what kind of diet or um, food plan should we be following, you know? Just because your um, medication is there, just because the procedure is there, it doesn't rule out the fact that your choices day-to-day -day have a huge impact on potential outcomes as well. And just the type of you know diet we have, the amount of fiber it has, prebiotics it has, um, can determine immensely the type of microbes that grow in our gut health and consequently, the reproductive microbiome as well. So if you're interested in learning more about this, get in touch with us, schedule an appointment, or always just drop us a line, send us a message, and we'd love to communicate about this.